Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, PBA A Noon webinar. Uh, we really appreciate, appreciate everyone's support and hope you are staying well and safe at home. Uh, today we have with us Bruce Hardy, president and founder from Myera Group. Myera is helping to transform the aquacultural industry through developing the best in class technologies and building cost effective and viable farms that have no marine environmental impact. Their farming methods could have an extremely positive impact on current food supply chain concerns. Hi Bruce, thanks for joining us and please start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the opportunity of sharing uh, what we've learned over the last uh, five years on our journey. Um, as a background, uh, I've been in the software industry for 25 years now. Uh, we specialize in delivering early childhood um, software in term across 12 clinical areas, looking at early childhood cognitive developmental disorders, things like FDA, uh, FASD, ADHD, that type of thing. Our software is delivered into 56 First Nations in Manitoba and uh, between 60 and 80 uh, health practitioners and nurses use our, our software on a daily basis. And what that has allowed us to do is to gain real insight into the connection between food and, and our health. And we can see from a very young age is the lack of um, things like omega-3s and 6s and DHA, which are critical for brain development. Um, in other research, we're also seeing that you know, the lack of, of over highly processed foods um, is also affecting our aging population. Um, with this re really uh, shift in thinking, um, I th there's a, a saying that we kind of um, talk about where we say that it's a, the future of food is medicine and the future of medicine is food. Um, and that concept is what we started with in that uh, we have started with a fish called Arctic char. Now, if you're familiar with Atlantic salmon or Pacific salmon or even Chinook salmon, um, they're all salmonoids and Arctic char just happens to be from the Arctic Ocean. So much like salmon, uh, it, it starts off in the ocean, it comes into where fresh water meet the uh, salt washer, they spawn and then their offspring go back out into the ocean and re repeat the cycle. Uh, around the 1970s, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans invested in Manitoba and set up a Department of Fisheries and Oceans research facility uh, fresh, with the Freshwater Institute. Uh, and they had about $30 million invested in that, in that facility uh, for the tanks and for the technology to, to raise the Arctic char. But they also invested uh, this, a similar amount, if not more, into the researchers to go into the Arctic to see which strain of Arctic char would be best for commercialization. So they looked at about six strains. The Nyuk strain is a strain that we were able to get. The reason why we have it now is that unfortunately there was great research done and it was one of those uh, kind of budget tightening things where they kind of closed down that facility in Manitoba. And so that strain, the Nyuk strain we had, went to a private business. Um, we recently, over the last five years, I've been able to acquire that strain, um, and with this next round, we'll end up having full control over that Nyuk strain of Arctic char. Um, having control over the Nyuk strain of Arctic char uh, gives us a really unique position in the market, and we'll be able to position our, our fish as a very high value and premium product. What we're seeing in the marketplace right now is that um, every week it's hard to pass the pass by seeing news articles where someone has invested 60 to 100 million dollars into a salmon farm. So what's kind of happening is that the salmon prices are starting to fall and as there become more inland Arctic char or sorry more inland farms specifically salmon um, it's actually kind of devaluing salmon to a bit is what we're seeing in the market conditions. Um, much like airlines uh, a lot of people want to have first class business class premium economy and economy. So this kind of shift in the in the marketplace um, is occurring and it's having the impact of that they're looking to what's going to replace uh, salmon that was a premium fish as that next premium kind of product. And Arctic char kind of fits that bill. Um, it's seen as a very, very high-end fish in the uh, uh, high-end restaurant markets. It has a, a very unique story behind it, um, and it's kind of filling that high-end market. So compared to um, salmon farms, we get a 30% to 35 to 40% premium that it's Arctic char. The other kind of interesting thing with Arctic char is that it 
exists under eight feet of ice in the winter time. And so if you were under eight feet of ice, you'd cuddle with your friends and your family to stay warm. Um, and I say that in a, kind of a tongue in cheek joke, but what it means from a business perspective is that compared to other salmonoids like salmon or trout, uh, Atlantic salmon, Pacific salmon, you can't uh, pack them into the same density. So that means your cost of goods sold is going to be about 30% higher because in order to make the fish of Arctic trout are comfortable, um, they actually uh, uh, need to be very tightly packed because that's how they, they grew up in the Arctic and, and that's the, one of the best things we can do is to increase the stocking density. Uh, so like we said, we can get 25% uh, or, or above, we're looking at 30 to 35% above in, in terms of premium plays for Arctic char um, and our cost of goods sold because we have that stocking density is like 30% less. Everything in our business plan is that we're putting ourselves on par for uh, salmon prices. Um, and that gives us both our investors and ourselves that cushion is that we know that we actually, uh, our costs of goods sold are less. Um, we have a premium uh, position and Arctic char that we have uh, in terms of a genetic strain, um, we have the full control over. So that's allowed us to, to do enormous amount of research on Arctic char, the Nyuk strain that we have and allows us and our shareholders to capture the value of it because we own the strain. Is this where I, Paul, I, I hope this is where we cut into the other one. Sorry, no, um, it's actually the next slide. So if you could go through this one as well and then halfway down the next one, that would be great. Okay, but I can sorry. cut all this off, so don't worry. Awkward. <laughs> uh, so um, <clears throat> in Manitoba, we, uh, we're very blessed in the sense that we have another industry. We have the hog industry. And we've learned an enormous amount from the hog industry. We learned that Manitoba can be a player on, this, on the international stage for animal-based protein. But along with those lessons, we also learned that the hog industry, when they sent up multiple farms, also created this tension with our government. And so there was uh, a lot of, pl of uh, public backlash because the, uh, the uh, lakes and the rivers were increasingly becoming uh, contaminated with the waste from the, the hogs. And there was a friction with the hog industry and other industries to say who is to blame for, for kind of that environmental degradation. So rather than kind of participating in that similar type of uh, activity that led to moratoriums and really led to the limitation of the growth of the hog industry, we've spent the last couple of years investing in technologies to look at as a positive. So as an example, one of the things that we've done is that we've looked at the fish pea um, and we actually grow in the summertime wild rice for that. So wild rice is uh, uh, actually has always been a part of the fish's life. Uh, wild rice self-propagates. And that's where when you go fishing, um, you find the fish in amongst the shallows, pretty much where the wild rice is. So when the wild rice falls in the winter time, the fish kind of eat it as it falls to the bottom. And there's really that natural relationship between uh, the fish and its, uh, its, its organics and actually promoting the growth of wild rice. So we're actually invested right now with the federal government on the protein innovation supercluster. We've lined up between uh, 2.8 and 3.5 million into the wild rice as to use it as a way to clean up with the fish pea. And we have equal amount of projects on the fish poo looking at ways, uh, innovative ways to collect that and actually turn that into a soilless soil. So we have vegetable production. So now all of a sudden in terms of our environmental uh, story, it becomes a really fascinating story. Um, in the summertime, we grow wild rice. In the wintertime, we have a strain of algae. Um, and in that algae, we've actually had um, funded some research projects to come up with a type 2 diabetes diabetic retinotherapy formulation. So not only did we pick an algae to help clean the water, we picked one that could become a nutraceutical. So our focus right now is on the fish, but that doesn't mean that we can't be innovative and make sure that we have long tails for our shareholders to value. So as we move along this year, our investment focuses on fish. Um, and as that R&D matures on the wild rice and on the LJ, then we have set tertiary markets that we can kind of make sure that we leverage into. Now that gives us a really beneficial relationship with the provincial and the federal government. So instead of actually having an adversarial relationship where they're trying to put taxes on us, we are doing something called restorative or regenerative agriculture. 
Um, so they see us as a part of climate same solution. Um, by even on, by, by it being able to situate our satellite farms near urban centers, we reduce our carbon footprint by delivering our products to the urban centers with a smaller footprint. But we can also do things like grow wild rice and grow vegetables in our greenhouses. So we're more part of a sustainable solution to supply chain management. And we're seeing this as a critical issue pop up with pandemics like COVID-19, where you have such long supply chains is that uh, the moment that you start to uh, um, have a, a blips in it, where as an example in the, in the um, beef industry, all of those different um, cow-calf operations and the, and the um, grow out lots are concentrating all their meat into being processed into, into facilities in Alberta. And because of COVID-19, now they're struggling with able to actually process all that beef. Now, in our particular situation, we actually have, for each of our farms, the technology to process the fish, to package it in the vacuum seal it, and actually put on the barcode and our client's uh, artwork on our packaging. And so we're very resilient when it comes to sustainable food food production because if one of our satellite farms um, is offline for whatever reason, it doesn't actually inhibit the rest of the satellite farms for producing food. So this is seen as a very advantageous, especially now in our, our current situation where, where the pandemic is threatening our, our food supply chains. So what we've done um, over the last five years is that we've uh, invested money into the actual Arctic tar strain itself. When I first started out, um, the uh, hatchery that I was working with, Rick McDonald, who had been doing it for 30 years, um, by applying things like machine learning and AI and different technologies, we've gone from hatching 60,000 eggs a year to 300,000 eggs a year. So this is kind of a testament where you have someone like me with a strong um, software development background getting into the agriculture space. And it's that synergies between kind of uh, the wisdom of people who've been in the industry for a long time, and you comply, uh, combine that with the innovation of, of software, if you will. And uh, we've been making huge advancements, not only in the fish side, uh, but also in the way in which we deal with the fish liquids and solids, or their PNF poo, if you will. Um, so with the uh, investment of the fish, we're also lined up with uh, Egg Canada and with the uh, ocean superclusters. And so in total, we have about $15 million with a matching federal, mon uh, federal money um, to co-invest into the investment that we're seeking now. Uh, this will allow us to, to expand uh, into a 250-ton uh, farm that we are bought the Department of Fisheries and Ocean site that I've previously mentioned. It has over $8.8 .8 million worth of stranded assets that we can start to use immediately. And we've been using those stranded assets as we've been growing. So we literally take the fiberglass tanks that they used in the 70s, we pressure wash them, we put a brand new gel coat on it, and they're just as strong and uh, as useful as they were as they were many years ago. So we have 8.8 .8 million in which to help to de-risk the investors because we can get to 250 metric tons just using the existing DFO facility and its stranded assets. The next level is to get to 860 metric tons, which is one of our modules. So a fish farm will have six modules. Each module is 860 metric tons. For one module, that's 30 jobs, a revenue of about 10 to 12 million per module. Um, and that turns translate into one semi a week going to Loblaws or to uh, Sobeys or to co-op. Um, and so that's constantly every week that's kind of for 860 metric tons. So 30 jobs to a rural area is huge. And so with the six, the opportunity of six modules, um, we have enormous amount of support from municipalities in terms of job creation. But for one semi in terms of uh, Loblaws or Costco, it's a very small part of their supply chain. So it's easy for them to be able to say, here's a purchase order for one uh, semi a week. And that turns into, uh, uh, again, 860 metric tons, uh, 30 jobs, and 10 to 12 million in revenue at an EBITDA of about 38% uh, to 40%. And so obviously in a six uh, module metric ton, that scales up to 5,600 uh, metric tons in total. 
once we hit this level, we will be the largest Arctic char farm in the world and we'll be operating at market prices well below others. So we have um, salt water in Manitoba. And so when the glaciers receded, um, they were left behind saltwater aquifers in Manitoba. So in terms of uh, what we've done to date is we've heavily invested in uh, filtration systems to be able to pull out the uh, minerals from that water, leaving behind glacial salt water. So we actually say our fish are raised in salt water um, and that's really important because by 2050, they're estimating that there'll be more plastic in the oceans than fish. And the microplastics that the fish end up eating um, is showing up in the fish in the ocean. So this really gives us a great value proposition to say, not only are we raising fish uh, that are not in the ocean, so they don't have those bioplastics, um, but we're raising them on glacial salt water. So that salt water um, hasn't cont been contaminated and is, uh, is from the ocean, uh, but from the, from the glacial period. In Manitoba, we also have one of the largest uh, green hydro projects. Um, and so our cost of hydro, a really important cost in, in inland farms. So we're looking at 23 cents per kilo, 30 cents per kilo compared to say, if you're doing it in BC, which would be uh, 80 cents per kilo in terms of the cost of, cost of goods sold for the fish. So we're very, very competitive. So if you have a, an, a aquaculture uh, operation that's on the coast of BC and a net pen, which are being closed down. And if you moved it inland, you'd be looking at over $10,000 a month to recreate your salt water. Your land would be incredibly expensive and your electricity would be close to uh, double what ours are, is here in Manitoba. So we have a huge opportunity to be the North America leader in aquaculture. And because of the salt water, if we had a six module farm, three of those modules could be Arctic char, two of those modules could be Chinook salmon, a module could be uh, contract raising reef fish from uh, Thailand or even Barramundi from Australia and helping those countries get into the US market. So we have a lot of different revenue potentials, not only growing our own Arctic char, but also growing other species of fish. Um, because Arctic char is so dense, um, our technology can allow us to pivot. So it's hard to notice in the news when you see every week go by someone investing between 60 and 100 million. So that's actually dropping the price of the, of the salmon fish. But if you invested in a salmon farm, then you couldn't pivot into Arctic char. It would cost enormous amount to retool a lot of your equipment to handle the density of the waste from Arctic char because you, the, the volume of the fish is so much higher than salmon. So that's why it's kind of strategic to invest in, in Arctic char farms is that allows us to pivot into many other kind of aquaculture industries. Um, and that can range from you know, warm water, salt water fish to cold water fish like Arctic char. So just in terms of understanding the industry, the reason why that uh, the aquaculture's industry is, is looking at 360 billion in terms of, of its market cap is based upon a couple of factors, is that some of the largest growing economies in the world, in the Asia, uh, fish account for over 80%, a very large percentage of their, their, their animal-based protein. Um, and with the collapse of the fishing industry slated for 2050, um, in addition to the to the the, the conditions of the oceans, uh, it's really pushing aquaculture as the premier way of for most of the world's population to shift into uh, into animal based protein. The other thing that we're learning from Beyond the Meat Burger is that there's a lot of health uh, and doctors and, and and nutritionists pushing back to say overly processed plant based protein. Um, is may not be as good for you as, as you think. Anything overly processed is not that great. Um, and so the pendulum has almost swung too far. Um, the other thing from longitudinal studies, people that are, are vegetarian and vegan um, have shorter life. They won't die from cardiac, cardiac arrest or from you know, the, the diseases that people are scared of from, from animal uh, meat, uh, but they are kind of having a shorter life because you do need some animal fats and protein. I know that's a, uh, that's a hotly contested statement on, on social media and whatnot, but there's a lot of people who, uh, and our kind of pitch on it is that if our fish are vegan, then you don't have to be because we're looking at creating our fish feed formulation from uh, the omega-3s and 6s from hemp and from flax because it's abundant in Manitoba. We can get hemp meal, flax meal. We can ensure that the omega-3s, 6s, and fatty acids, DHA profiles that your body needs. 
so that your fish can be vegan and you don't. So we're kind of, we tease around with the idea of Segan. Um, and that also plays into the fact that in terms of sustainability, for a hog, you need three pounds of feed to get one pound of animal protein. Whereas fish, you have one pound of feed equals to one pound of animal fish protein. So that kind of gives you that complete picture where it's not only economically better, um, but it also looks at different kind of issues in terms of uh, the sustainability. And just from the economics, if you look at a cost of goods sold, uh, if you have a hog barn, um, you can't stack hogs. And it looks kind of funny if you try. Um, but with fish and eight feet of water, you can stack them quite well. Um, because fish, and again, what's special about our char uh, is, that, uh, is that they really do like to cuddle. And so in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, return on investment, we can get a lot more out of, out of artichar than, than uh, obviously salmon, but way exceed that of, of other animal-based proteins. The final thing that I want to talk about here um, in terms of, of the aquaculture technology is that it's very difficult to do this. And in the time of COVID, we're seeing the implications of having multiple farms and feedlots uh, providing all of their pigs or all of their cattle to a single point of failure. So right now with COVID shutting down, uh, say with, with uh, um, the meat processing plants in Alberta, that's having a ripple effect across Canada in terms of the projection of increase of, of cost of food because of COVID. In our particular case, the technology and automation of processing the fish all the way into the finished package with the barcode. Um, we're working with Morel, which is one of the state-of-the-art automated fish processing uh, equipment manufacturers in the world, um, is that a lot of this design engineering had to be done in mind that you have ships out at sea bobbing up and down, very tight spaces, and you have to process the fish as soon as it comes out of the water. Um, and preserve that fish so that by the time that that ocean line, that uh, trawler gets back to the port, um, that fish quality is still there. So if you can do this in the ocean, then why can't we do this for each of our satellite farms? And in fact, that's what we're doing. So um, we started out looking at the hatchery. So we have now two Arctic char hatcheries in Manitoba, and that's for uh, Obviously, if there's an act of God or uh, there's a disease that takes out one hatchery, we have a redundant hatchery. Uh, the nursery then provides to the grow out the one inch fish. And then each of the grow outs has its own processing facility built into it. So our fish, our design and uh, fish farms are based upon 860 ton modules. Each 860 ton module pr will produce a semi per week um, of product going directly um, and we're talking about a private label or Myera label branded with barcodes of, you know, President's Choice, Loblaws, or Co-op Gold going straight to their food distribution center. So we own that supply chain. Um, and fish is very one of the few industries, I think, where you can actually have that complete supply chain from uh, hatchery all the way through to being able to do co-packing and branded packaging uh, for other people. Um, our team is, uh, this is just focused on the fish team, but we also have a team that's dedicated to recovering the, the pee and the poo, if you will. They're not listed here uh, because the focus of this current round is, is on the fish. Um, just some market advantages uh, is that here, what we're looking at is, uh, is again, the, the premium of, uh, of Arctic char. Um, one of the benefits, and I'm kind of a glass half full kind of guy, is that Arctic char has a different, uh, the consistency of its color is sometimes it's white and sometimes it's really deep pink. And so one of the examples of technology we have is that at, when that comes out of our hatchery, we can tell the grow out of the, say the 50,000 fish, how many of the flesh color will be lighter and how many of it will be deep pink. Now the Indian community in terms of uh, uh, East Indian uh, cuisine, really, really flavor, uh, favor and will pay a premium for the lighter color of fish. Whereas restaurants want uh, eight inch fish and they want it to be very, very pink. So when you cut up, open your fish in a high-end restaurant, you expect the Arctic char to be deep pink. So rather than trying to genetically engineer a fish, we're using things like machine learning and AI and sensors to be able to make sure that our customers not only get, but feel great about paying a premium 
for what their customers want. And it's all about shortening that supply chain. So we tie that market pull all the way through the supply chain using blockchain technology so that we can tell that restaurant, we can tell that, that market that you will get predictably what you expect. So again, just to kind of start to wrapping up, you know, we have Arctic char, which is, uh, we have the unique strain. And so the Arctic char Nayuk strain, we have complete control over it. Um, there has been over 30 million to $60 million worth of investment from DFO selecting the strain as the best strain for, uh, for commercial potential. Uh, and we have been working on the technology to make sure that the sustainability or what we do with the PN and Poo is addressed. Um, and we've also done some other really unique things in terms of making sure that we're competitive, uh, working with NRC, the National Resource Council on a, a plant-based fish feed formulation. Um, on that, we're working with the ocean supercluster. And again, that's where some of the federal money is coming in, uh, is to make sure that our, our feed stock is actually pure, uh, meets these kind of uh, ocean wise and other kind of uh, brands that we can, we can make sure that our customers realize what they're, what they're eating will make them very healthy. So kind of going back to the numbers, um, we have 500,000 fish that we spawned last year. When I first started work, working with Rick McDonald from B&B &B Fish, who I, we have been slowly buying out all of the Arctic char from him. Um, when the first year that I worked with him, he was producing about 60,000 fry. Um, we're now up to 300,000 fry a year. So that's just with, uh, you know, I come from a software background. I come from a, a systems analysis and design. Um, I'm very, very a big fan of, of, uh, of, of obviously software processes, but I'm bringing that plus my healthcare side to, to this uh, food production industry. And we can really see the benefit of that. Um, so we not only have uh, the 500,000 kind of fingerlings that will lead us to 2.8 million in sales within the next, uh, within the next year, um, but we also are working with Ice Fresh um, out of uh, Iceland. Um, and so we'll be taking their fish, which they're currently bringing into the North American market through the States, except bringing that in through Canada. Using the Morel equipment, we'll take that uh, 12 or 18 or 20 inch fish and then actually cut it up into individual pork regions, uh, value add that, and then bring that into the uh, co-op Loblaws or supply chain as a joint venture or partnership agreement with Ice Fresh. What this means is that we have cash flow almost immediately in the first quarter. Um, so we'll be able to uh, capitalize on the uh, equipment. We're looking at the highly automated equipment. Um, and again, our farms are based upon 860 t metric ton modules. Uh, when we're working with Manitoba Hydro, when we're looking at at land, we're looking at six modules. So that's a total of 5,600 metric tons. And so in this kind of projections, you can see us scaling up to 5,600 metric tons, which gets us into the EBITDA around 53% um, of EBITDA getting, and, uh, and the sales, as you can see, the, the revenue scales up quite nicely as well. So we, uh, we want to be able to get our first couple modules up and going. Uh, we have $8.8 .8 million worth of stranded assets from the former Department of Fisheries and Oceans facility. We're talking about fiberglass tanks that don't depreciate. Uh, they're just as useful as they were in the 1970s as they are to us now. And in fact, we've been using tanks from the uh, former DFO facility for all of our research. We literally grab the fiberglass tank, we use a pressure washer, we put a new gel coat on it, and it saves us an incredible amount of money rather than buying brand new tanks. Um, and so we have 250 metric tons and uh, worth of uh, stranded assets from the former Department of Fisheries and Ocean site we can uh, immediately capitalize on um, to get us to cash flow, to get our products into market. Um, while we're developing the first 860 Myera metric ton uh, farm. And then with each of those uh, purchase orders, uh, we'll then trigger another module. And so this isn't an all or nothing game. We can get to 250 metric tons and then uh, we can either wait for more investment, we can self-finance, we have lots of options. We get to our first 860 metric ton module and then we would expect from Costco or Loblaws to issue a purchase order for another 860 metric tons. So from their perspective, one semi a week isn't very much. Um, and we only need one semi to be able to make profitable one of our modules. Uh, so a total farm, uh, a six modules would be six semis a week. 
Um, in our business plan, we're hoping to have six farms within Manitoba. We've already found those sites and we're working hard to uh, work with the municipalities to get them aware um, that this is coming. Um, and with 30 jobs per module, the economic impact to rural areas is beyond phenomenal. Um, we have municipalities wanting to give us land because they want the job so much. Um, we're very choosy on where we set this up because we would like that perfect mixture of salt water, fresh water, uh, hydroelectricity, and, and kind of uh, transportation logistics considerations. Um, I haven't been taking questions up until now, but I see that there's uh, some popping up. And so I, I hope that uh, I've covered everything. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Bruce, I'm just going to go over the questions with you. Um, let's get started here. What is the growth cycle of Ar Arctic char? Um, so, uh, so there's two kind of questions in this one is that uh, there's these beginning stages. So as you kind of ramp up uh, into, uh, I'll just uh, switch over to me. So as you kind of ramp up to steady state, so steady state is if you have an 860 metric ton farm, then uh, you kind of ramp up into that and then you're consistently producing 860 metric tons, which turns out to a semi a week. Um, and so it's really that how long does it take to get up steady state and once you're there, then it, you, you just keep it there. Um, the specific answer to that question is that uh, we have broodstock, which um, hatch eggs, if you will, once a year. And from that, it's the temperature of the water that allows us to control the amount that we release. So every three months, a satellite farm gets around 50,000 fish or 100,000 fish, whatever that satellite farm needs. Um, so in the first month, they would get a round of fish. And then every the third month, we would actually control the rate of which those fingerling grow to then send it to the satellite farm. Once the satellite farm gets it at an inch or two inches, then depending on the season. So in the summertime, people like a 20 inch fish because they put it on the barbecue. Whereas in the winter season or off season, people want a smaller fish because they want it in the oven. And if you're looking at markets kind of like restaurants, they want an eight inch fish because they want it on the plate. So that is a really great question. The great part about it is that we have fidelity in our system. So that means if we need to have bigger fish in the winter, each degree of water temperature will reduce it by a month. And so if we need to get more fish to market because there's a demand during this peak, then we can also then turn it down. So if we drop the temperature of the water by a couple of degrees, then it'll slow them down. So unlike uh, other industries, we can sell our, our fish whenever we want. Whereas if you have cow-calf operation, your cows go to auction, the auction. And if you don't like the price at the auction, you're not going to bring your cows home. Okay? <laughs> and so we really have a lot of more fidelity in terms of we can, you know, we can actually slow down and speed up um, to be able to hit those, those very peaks of the market in terms of segment and jurisdiction. Excellent. So here's a question. Uh, will the price of, uh, well, they said salmon, but your uh, Arctic char at the supermarket be reasonable or will only the rich be able to buy it? <laughs> um you know what uh, that's that's a that's a great question um i think that i think that uh, uh for myself uh the i think that the price of salmon will continue to go down and i think that arctic char price will come down a little bit as we bring more product to market um and but i think that that we will be in the premium space uh, I think that there's different ways to uh, address kind of uh, getting, I think that's a strategy idea is to say, uh, do you want to get a version of our Arctic char into a, a low, the low cost marketplace? We don't have to, no, I don't, I would rather stay, <laughs> honestly, you know, we have uh, our cost of goods sold is 30% less than salmon. And if we can make a lot of money in the beginning of the, of the company, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'd, I'd like to keep making money because that allows us to expand and then the prices will come down if we have we have satellite farms across canada um growing arctic char the prices will come down over time okay, excellent um here's one um farmed fish have notoriously bad rap what can you say about this yeah well that's a that's an awesome one um, I, I never actually uh, when i got into this i saw the art the aquaculture industry um the my original business idea uh, was to deal with the waste of the aquaculture industry. So I actually led with uh, LJ, 
Um, and so my original business plan was to bolt onto and lease property uh, from an, an aquaculture facility and then take their liquids and then grow LJ for nutraceuticals. Um, and so the product that I invested in was for diabetic retinotherapy. So over 80% of uh, First Nations children who have diabetes lose their eyesight. Um, and then the, the aging population, when you start to get a little bit of weight around you, half of the eye loss in middle-aged men and women uh, are pre-diabetic, lose their eyesight. So we have a strain of allergy that will prevent that eyesight loss. So this is what got me into this industry. But when I started looking at the fish itself and how it was raised, it was alarming. Um, fish farm was, uh, that I was associated with was a state-of-the-art model farm. And so it was supposed to be the creme de la creme in terms of design. It was a long fish tank. It looked like, a, this, the, if you can imagine in your head, a uh, uh, curling, uh, curling rink. Yeah. Uh, so it's about uh, 200 feet long, 40 feet wide. All the fish were in the same water. So that means the two inch fish were running their little butts off, very, very stressed because the water velocity to them was really, really fast. And then the 18 to 24 inch fish, the water velocity was too slow. And they had to oversaturate the oxygen for the baby fish so that there was enough oxygen that went around as to feed the, the, uh, the large fish. So that meant that your baby fish were always stressed, that ate you out of house and home, really bad for business, but your older fish that you're sending to market were fat, lazy, and diseased. And I had, you know, this is where I was like, I can't handle this because now we have contaminated water because the mortality was too great, too high. So I had the standard that I came into this industry where I need to have, and I would like to go for health claims to say, if you have our fish three times a week, because of our fish feed and the algae I told you will help save your eyesight from eyesight loss. I'm operating at this standard. So we actually developed a tank technology, and again, using machine learning and AI, I own a software company, so I have engineers, right? I'm like, how do we build a better fish tank? So we have machine learning and AI technology where the two inch fish, we have an exercise program for them. <laughs> and it's very different than the six inch fish or the 18 inch fish. And based upon the research that we did with the University of Manitoba, it turns out from a metabolomic perspective, when you feed the fish and you exercise them for two hours really fast, it recruits white muscle. And right, white muscle is what you buy, it's what you eat, and it is what makes you healthy. If the water is too slow, then it recruits red muscle. And it's red muscle that when you cook fish, it turns gray and you throw it out and it's not good. And if you don't exercise those fish two hours a day, they won't be healthy. So that's one part of what makes a fish healthy or not healthy. The other part that makes a fish unhealthy, and a lot of this, the reports that you see on uh, the world's deadliest, uh, most poisonous food is, is fish, that's coming out of uh, investigative research reports out of Denmark and Norway. Denmark and Norway get their fish feed formulations from two sources. One of them is the actual uh, Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is so contaminated body of water, it's illegal to sell the fish out of it to, for human consumption. So what do they do? They put it into fish feed. <laughs> it's, it's mind boggling. It's ab absolute makes for great entertainment for documentaries. The other source is they use eels from Thailand. So they import eels and eels are super hot, very, very oily, like 60%. Salmon, only need less than like about 30% oil or amino acid, like for lipid content. And so because there's so much oil, the fish that from Denmark and Norway that are being raised as an alarm are causing diabetes in the human population because we're giving feed to these fish that they were never meant to have. The final example I wanna give is that the other source of fish feed is a combination of ocean. So if it has Fukushima water, if it has the contaminants from ocean in terms of bycatch, surprise, it, it shows up in our, in our land-based fish feed, uh, land-based farms. But the other more critical issue is that if we feed our fish st um, uh, starches like corn or soy, the fish can't upregulate that into omega-3s and 6s. So if you've fed them soy and corn, they can't have omega-3s and 6s. Where is it gonna come from? It's not magic. So that's why I never wanted to get into the fish feed formulation business. We're working with NRC because we wanted to make sure if we gave them flax and hemp that have huge, the right ratios, omega-3s and 6s, if we fed that to our fish, guess what they have? 
the perfect omega-3 for our health. And again, what sets me apart from many other people is that I actually come from the health sector. I want to be able to have our, our QR code and using blockchain technology to allow moms to be able to say, if I feed this product to our kids three times a week, I should start seeing diabetes go down. I should be able to see these health benefits because I think that's where the future of food is. So our saying is the future of food is medicine and the future of medicine is food. Okay, um, one last question so we can wrap it up. Um, what are you looking for right now in terms of financing and moving forward? Yeah, so right now we're looking at doing a, a raise for about 8 million. Um, and that's, that will lead into a total raise about 15 million. And the 15 million will, is kind of chunked up into three steps. So the first step is to, to get up and going and be able to issue our, our, our uh, subscription documents, uh, maybe have one or two people who are really excited about this be our, our kind of first investors. Uh, really laid the groundwork. Um, and then the second investment is to hit the 250 ton uh, mark. And so that's using the stranded assets from the former Department of Fisheries and Ocean site. Um, and that gets us to a positive cash flow that takes the pressure off everyone. And then we expand into the first 860 ton module. Um, and then that 15 million investment will get us to a position where we can then decide do we want to take on more investment and grow fast or we could pretty much self-invest after the 15 million of raise um, i will have matched that with close to 15 million in government money so our total raise will be 30 million of which only 15 is coming from from uh, debt equity uh, and then the rest is being leveraged through through government so that creates a really risk re risk reduced environment um, and it gives us enormous amount of options uh, so the questions that I don't have answers to is I found six sites in Manitoba and there's always lots of questions. Well, what about sites in you know, other places in, in Canada, US or internationally? Um, so those plans of how do we license this, these satellite farms into Australia? Um, the Australia government has announced uh, two weeks ago funding to be able to bring our technology into Australia. We have 250,000 a year for the next eight years um, because they're so excited about this technology and bringing it to Australia. They want to have bilateral trade agreements. Um, so the final point on this is that even though we talk about Arctic char, in a fish farm of six modules, maybe three modules are Arctic char, a module is Barramundi because we're contract growing Barramundi for Australia and bringing it into the US market. Maybe one of those 860 ton modules is uh, Chinook salmon. Um, it's easy for us to pivot into other fish. Um, because the Arctic char are so dense and our technology can deal with if we can deal with arctic char we can grow any other fish um, and so the the really big value added in the future will be shifting into the asian market but we'd focus on working with uh, we currently are working with the thai government um, because they have a real problem with uh, they've they've cut off fishing reef fishing and so reef fish are very 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 premium kind of fish um, and we could adapt our system to grow reef fish uh, so we have an interest at government levels into, into our project, uh, and it's been a very exciting time. Excellent. Um, so Paul, I'll hand it over to you, and Bruce, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for your questions. We couldn't get to all of them, uh, but we'll try and, uh, and reach out to you guys personally. Uh, Bruce, thank you. Very, very interesting story. I only have one question for you. Uh, where can people buy your product now? Like in what stores would you, are you selling, or when? what stores would you be selling into? Um, so currently, the, the sales that we have has been through Gimli, uh, Gimli Fish Market, and we've been working with them to smoke our salmon, to look at different smoking techniques, um, and we're currently working with co-op uh, for a private label, and as part of that, we would also like to have a premium label in co-op stores. So co-op has over 250 grocery stores across the prairies. Um, and we were thinking just strategically uh, that we'd start off with co-op and then that would give us the credibility to get into to kind of uh, lob laws and, and, uh, and, the, um, and the Costco's of the world, if you would like. Uh, and then we'd like to be able to create this narrative of the story about how green and clean we are uh, for, for, a pri for our own uh, high value brand. No, excellent, Bruce. Th and thank you so much. Great, great presentation. A fantastic story. Um, and we will get back to you with more questions and we can uh, put that back to our people. Thank you everyone for listening in today. Very much appreciated as usual. Yeah.